SSL protects data and motion. So let's go to the number one place where there's a lot of data, a lot of motion, and a lot of protection of it. Here at the number one site on the internet, Google. Let's talk to Stephen McHenry about the now and the next of SSL. I couldn't wait to check in and get started, getting FaceTime with one of the oracles of TLS and SSL. But to respect both Stephen and the technology, we started with the basics. As much as SSL is known for its encryption component, I wanted his critical insight on how the authentication component is important to Google. Encryption is different than authentication. SSL and TLS actually provide for both. The server is going to present a certificate that says, I am this server that you expect to be talking to. And so the client then has to authenticate that by following the certificate chain up to a trusted route. The encryption piece is such that every packet you send is a mathematical algorithm is applied to it to make it undecipherable to someone who's just eavesdropping and pulling bits off the wire. You could encrypt without authenticating, but then what you wouldn't know is who you were talking to at the other end. So no one would be able to see what you sent the other end, but the other end might not be who you thought it was. And likewise, you could authenticate and not encrypt, so you would know you're talking to the right place, but then anybody listening along the way could, could eavesdrop on the communication. So both are very important. With the basics nailed down, I went straight to advancing the trust ecosystem. That calls for delicately balancing the technology future versus widespread current usage. So I crawled into Stephen's brain regarding healthy transition. I think it would be the broken client libraries and the broken implementations out there. As we make changes, what happens is client libraries that were introduced that don't work properly. What happens is you make a change on the server side and now you break a couple million phones that can no longer talk to the servers that they need to talk to. And then you have a choice. You live with broken phones for a while uh, and users live in an insecure world or users are taught to click through these warnings, which is a bad idea, very bad idea, or the phone people come to the people that change the server and say, you have to roll that change back and so it inhibits progress. And you can't roll forward and keep the balance between security and cost going. You're, you're actually delaying changes that you want to make because you almost have a foot nailed in the past by all these older client libraries that you have to talk to. So that's probably the single most important thing in the ecosystem today. I love Google's fun atmosphere of ball pits and pool tables and dinosaurs with pink flamingos. But look beneath the fun. Their minds are on what users do with technology, like mobile and the Internet of Things. But you can't secure what's next without prioritizing what to protect now. I would think everything, every communication between two endpoints should be encrypted. Uh, and again, we're balancing cost versus the requirement of privacy. If you have a very low-powered device, a very low-powered phone, or a brooch that transmits your location, you're trying to use the cheapest processor you can in, in, in this, or a watch. You know, there are now internet-enabled watches. You might not want to put SSL in it, okay? Because it's costly to establish the connection, and it's a very low-powered computing device. And by low power, I mean low computational power. In an ideal world, why wouldn't you want all of your communication to be encrypted? Why would you want anything to be exposed unless you, the user, wanted to expose it? Stephen is a man in demand, so we had time for one last topic. We mere mortals have a rough time moving from great idea through adoption to standardization. So why is there an adoption lag? I think the biggest thing responsible for lag is the fact that there are legacy devices out there. There's still plenty of XP out there. I'm sure there's, there's some Windows 2000 out there, which doesn't update at all. Uh, and so Windows XP only updates on demand, or if you set a bit that says auto-update, which most people do not do. So 
if you instantly mandated a change and the change had to go in and everybody had to understand that in order to work, all those old clients would break. And so as a result, what we try and do when we introduce a change to the standard is we specify how it should work and then we say clients should adopt this, right? So for a period of time, it's not mandatory. And then at some point in the future, we figure that stuff is old enough that it should have gone away. In some cases, or maybe even trying to provide an incentive for people to move forward. If they're on Windows 2000, it would be a good thing if they moved forward to a modern operating system because there are so many vulnerabilities. We're trying to provide a window to make the change not painful but ultimately, if you don't say at some point it's mandatory, you never move into the future. What a great opportunity to not only get the perspective of someone who's expert in SSL, but passionate about it too. Hope you learned something. I certainly did. Catch me for the next installment in the series. Until then, I'm Jeff Bardo for Symantec.